almost everybody should be here that we're waiting for. Okay, perfect. So it looks like it's already recording. So we'll go ahead and welcome our guest today, Dr. Ore Adedoyen. Um, she is um, a, an alumni of obviously the University of Kentucky, but began her journey at the University of Ibanon in Nigeria, where she received a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy, and then came to Lexington and received her Master of Science in Kinesiology and Health Promotion, and then went on to her PhD in Pharmaceutical Sciences with us. Um, after that, Experience, she pursued a postdoc position at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And upon um, finishing that, she started serving as senior medical researcher and editor at Shoreland Inc. So we're very excited to have her here today and learn about her experiences. And I'll turn it over to Yulia. Thanks, Rosa. And thank you, Dr. Ardadoen, for being here and meeting with us and donating your time to answering all of our questions about your career and how you get to where you are today. Um, I want to start with asking you to describe your average work day or work week in your current position. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me again. I sincerely do appreciate it because I remember being in your shoes and having to, well, having the opportunity to listen to other people who just graduated or who were far along in their career. And it actually did form an indelible impression in my mind regarding the fact that there's not a one size fits all to this whole thing about living life and having a career and enjoying it. So I'm very grateful and I, I sincerely hope that, you know, this makes a difference in someone's life as well. So how do I describe my average day at work? Usually my early hours are spent scouring a, a vast majority of sources, um, both nationally and internationally, global health resources, trying to figure out what's new, what's breaking news, especially when it comes to our list of infectious diseases that we care about, um, whether they're vaccine preventable or, vac or non-preventable, and also some of the drugs that are used to prevent or for prophylaxis. So a typical example is I look through the FDA side, CDC, I go to the Australian, Canadian, um, British, European Euro Union, um, some Asian sites as well. We have a list actually that I go through and that helps me stay on track. Okay, what's new? Anything, has anything changed? Is there anything new we need to put out there? Is there a new vaccine indication? Is there an expanded age range? Is there uh, a new disease outbreak? You know, that's oh, it's tending to become a pandemic, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and then I collate my results and I usually send that to um, my, my, the director of the team. And then we go back and forth and he's like, oh yeah, this is worth sending an alert out or no, just do some more, some more research. We contact a few MSLs trying to see what can you tell us or we contact some of our tips and we call them Travax International Partners and they give us you know, information about what we see online. And that way we authenticate our, our information before we send it out to all the subscribers. And then that's, First few hours of the day, that's what I try to get done. And then during the day, I already have preset tasks for the month. So we have a calendar for the year and ahead of time, I know when tasks are due and I know, okay, when do I need to start my research for X, Y, Z? And then I begin to either do research or move the task along or move it to the next person next um, or do some extra research to say, hey, I'm really not sure that we can go ahead with this. Who can I ask a question about this? So I'll give you a very typical example. We just ended the month of June, right? So last month, um, preset tasks for the month were HPV, that's human papillomavirus, and um, um, was the polio? Oh no, it was um, BCG vaccine and you know some some articles like that. So earlier in last month, I had done research trying to figure out is there anything new regarding the vaccines, any new indications, epidemiology, you know, clinical presentations, and then I come up with all the results, present that to the team. So I have to give a presentation at least twice a month to the team and say, okay, this is what we have out there. This is what we put on our website, but these are the new findings. And what do you think about changing this? Can we use this language? CDC said this, but this is what the Australia uh, therapy 
good food administration is saying. Should we tweak our language? Can we um, verify what source is more current? And then based on that meeting, I usually get some more homework to do. I have to go on PubMed or read up some clinical trials and then come back to the team usually about three days later or at least a week, at most a week later and say, okay, here are my findings. And then we conclude on what edits need to be made. And then I go ahead and, and get that done. So that is on average, that's what happens. But stuff happens, you know, along the way where there's something more urgent that comes up and on my task list, you know, I have different levels of urgency. This is high priority. And if something more urgent comes up, then it bumps that out of the way. And then we put the new one on. So how do I describe my typical day? One thing I do is I'm not in the lab. I am behind the computer and my brain does more work than my mixing and dissecting <laughs> animals. Does. So I think, I hope that kind of summarizes a little bit of what I do. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm going to have some more examples later on. So, How has your routine changed with the pandemic and working from home, not going to the office? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, full disclosure, the office isn't that far from home. In 10 minutes, I could be at work if I need to. And I think one thing I miss is I had my, you know, I had my office, I had my privacy, I had my standing desk, you know, you can walk standing, you can sit. And then with my colleagues, we used to go on walks every day, or almost every day. And so that way we got to catch up on shows we were watching or, you know, just life. So I think that's one different thing. But in terms of my work schedule, I have more independence because initially it was actually very, very tasking because coronavirus, I mean, when COVID hits, we kind of found out about it earlier than most people. So before the end of last year, we knew. And, and I'll be honest, when the, when the director of the medical team sent out the alert and said, hey, there's something coming up, you know, let's find out from our folks on the ground in China let's touch base with them. And then I was in the holiday mode and I was like, oh, he's just exaggerating. That's the problem. He should, you know, and uh, like, I just want to enjoy my holiday. I don't want to be stressed out. But like within the first few weeks of the year, we'd set up a COVID response team at work. And they were actually, because initially I was a part of that team. So they were overwhelmed with a lot of work. And then um, the director sent us an SOS to everybody else and said, hey, would you, we need help, you know, on this team. We had a lot of the analysts on the team. They had, I think, one or two interns working on the team. And they wanted other people to join in. And, you know, I tried to be a good team player. And I said, yeah, I can help. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got tasked with literature, literature review, which was good for me, you know, because I mean, it's stuff you do in grad school, stuff I did in my postdoc, but it's like you're scouring I would, hundreds of sources every day. I mean, and I really mean literally hundreds of articles, hundreds of articles, reading them every day, trying to find out, okay, what's new? What's actually unauthentic? And I try to summarize, like doing a mini literature review. So I think within three or four weeks, you know, the, the, the team, team lead said, hey, I think this is really your thing. But we need, we get people asking us questions about how long does this virus survive on surfaces? And this was before any research had been published on SARS-CoV-2, the actual virus for this pandemic. And he said, so you have to go online and read everything you can find and then come up with a systematic review. Well, not a systematic review, just a, a review, a mini review. And if you can get this to us in 48 hours. And I was like, what? I mean, I didn't say that, but my brain said, what? You know how long it takes to read and do a review and then come up with something that's true. And, you know, and initially, to be honest, I just grumbled in my mind, but I had a smile on my face. And I, I but I, I did the work, you know, it took me a few, a few sleepless nights. But honestly, it reminded me of grad school. And to me, it was like, you can do this. It's not a big deal, you know, it's stuff we leave, we breathe, we do all the time, you know, and, and you know, I did it, got it, sent it to, to the team, and honestly, I got very good feedback, like, all the way to the director, of the, he's in DC, and I was like, 
thank you so much. This is very good. We're very grateful you could do this. And it actually helped me see that, you know, even if you feel you're not valued, you have a lot stored in you that when push comes to shove, it's just going to come out. You'll find it easy to do the tasks that you feel like right now, right now you're being trained. Right now we're being, you know, being pushed through the tough times and being harassed and being stressed out. But honestly, life is better on the other side. You know, I just want to encourage you about that. Life is better on the other side. And I mean, when tough times come, you have stuff to draw out from. You have a lot in you, a lot that's built in you that you can draw out from. So my tasks changed. So my everyday schedule for the year that I knew, I knew that I had to do coronavirus stuff on top of that. And so it was just about, okay, adjusting priorities. Coronavirus became the urgent task. It became the most urgent task actually. And even if my tasks were delayed by a day or two or three, everybody in the whole team, in the whole company actually understood. And we knew that this was crucial. And so till, I would say till March, April, when cases started to plateau and then dwindle, that was like my every day. So every morning, it wasn't just reading and finding out about the diseases that, I, that were on my list and the vaccines. It was actually more focused on finding out more about coronavirus, reading the articles that just been published, and then finding out, okay, what's new? What can we incorporate in our article? What can we say that's new right now? So just being flexible, being adaptable, and not being so rigid about A plus B always equals C. Yeah, that's science. But in the real world, A plus B could be equal to X. You just have to figure out how to get to X and, you know, bend, <laughs> do, do all you can, you know, to make it work. So that was a very long-winded answer, right? But oh, that was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that was a great, very informative answer. Just, oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, all of our schedules have completely derailed for a long time with COVID. So I know yeah. some of the graduate students in the college are working on uh, related, COVID related stuff now and have yeah. more or less dropped their actual graduate research. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and yeah, <laughs> truly, uh, in the big picture, big, big picture, you know, this is what's what everybody cares about now because it's killing people. And we're scientists. It's our job to try to find solutions based on, you know, whatever skills we have, whatever we've learned over time. And so even aside from the fact that it's work related, people out there, my friends, my, my cousins, my siblings, they want to know, you're the scientist, what should we do, you know, or what should we not do, or what's, when is this going to end, that's what my daughter asks, <laughs> when is coronavirus going to go, it's so unfair, that is her everyday mantra, you know, and, but they want to know, and as scientists, that's the question that we all trying to solve right now, and so it does make sense to, you know, try to figure out what's happening, and how can we all get to the other side you know we don't want we don't want to be lost with this whole pandemic <laughs> yeah. nobody wants that you know but people people are actually sick people are dying and whatever we can do you know putting our brains together to try to solve the problem i think would be best for us all <laughs> yeah, i agree yeah yeah so uh what uh skills and experiences have prepared you most for your current role from grad school and yeah. back? to today? Yeah, I think in terms of skills, the biggest one I could see is agility being and being flexible because what you're studying now in grad school, I mean, it doesn't mean that's what you're going to study for the rest of your life. The problem you're trying to solve right now in grad school is just a problem that's helping you develop skills helping develop perseverance, <laughs> patience, and other life, life skills that actually help you in the real world. So when I think about it, I think about all my rotations in grad school. They were all very, very different. And then my dissertation work as well was completely different from my rotations. And then my postdoc work was completely, completely different from what I did in grad school. And so 
all that gave me confidence that no matter what comes my way, and as long as it's science, or as long as I can read up on it, or I can find, so, I mean, yeah, I might be stumped for the first few days, but as a, you're being trained as scientists and as researchers to be able to solve problems, regardless of what kind of problem it is, regardless of the name of the problem, it's a problem, and therefore we're being trained to solve the problems. So how did grad school prepare? I mean, grad school, grad school taught me perseverance. Grad school taught me that the topic doesn't really matter. It's the skills that you need to solve that problem that matters. So reading about it, trying to ask the correct questions, trying to understand the, the um, tools they used to solve the problem, what experiments they did. Okay, now I'm doing infectious disease research. I did nothing like that in grad school, you know, and it was more about reading about a whole new field that also involves bioterrorism, you know, and also trying to communicate with people who are not my peers. So sometimes I have to reach out to people in drug companies or reach out to, or when we go on conferences, we're having meetings with the opinion leaders. And I'm like, oh, I didn't learn that in grad school. But grad school taught us not just lab skills, but leadership skills as well. I mean, being a member of AAPS, being a member of, um, some of these smaller committee, committees at grad school, it wasn't just about going through school to learn to get A's in my courses. It was going through school to learn to be a global citizen. And so when you're in meetings, grad school taught me, in meetings, you speak up, you ask questions. You don't just keep quiet and say, oh, okay, I'm just here to be a, a number. No, you ask questions, you ask, try to ask the right questions. Grad school taught me perseverance. You don't give up. So even when people say, oh no, this is too hard, in my mind, I'm like, no, nah, we haven't even tried, you know, or why should we just say it's impossible? Let's, okay, let me go back and do the research, find out how much it's gonna take out of us. You never say no. I mean, I don't know if you say no in grad school now, but your PI says, hey, let's try to do this. The, the first answer is okay. And then you go back, you try to read, has this been done before? What resources are we gonna need? Do we have the funds to actually do this? Do we have the time to do this? And then trying to find out, okay, what lab has this that I need? Or is there a postdoc in that lab that can teach me this real quick? And so before you say no, you already, you first of all try to find the solutions. So I think skills like that, you know, reading for long hours and being able to come up with the key points, you know, you read so many papers every day. And if you're not careful, you just get lost. But well, grad school taught me that, yeah, you might have 200 papers you have to read within the next two days. All that matters is you know how to skim through the paper, find out who the authors are, what's the abstract, what are their conclusions, and then come up with, okay, so this, this is the problem to try to solve, you know, and this is the answer. And so grad school taught me a lot of things, but one thing, I didn't think about in grad school was I always thought that, okay, what you're doing now in grad school is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. But that's not true. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. Maybe that's the point I should try to make. And the confident, confidence I had in the fact that in grad school, yeah, I did transdermal drug delivery. I did pulmonary drug inhalation delivery. I did um, cancer research. I did... Um, um, cardiovascular research, postdoc, I did nephrology research. So starting a new job as an infectious disease research was not a big deal to me because I have the mental agility to switch through this, 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 and successfully switch. And so that confidence that I had from grad school, I was able to carry that over to my real everyday work. So if I decide to leave my job, job today to go to a different field, it's not going to be a big deal to me because I have all the successes from grad school, my postdoc training to draw from, and all those give me confidence, you know, going forward that we're trained to be scientists, solve problems, regardless of what the problem is, we should be able to, you know, make a dent, even if we don't cure cancer, at least make a significant contribution to it. Yeah, that, that's good. That's a really good take. I hadn't thought about it on on that scale that yeah. everything is somewhat transferable to something. That's true. You might not know what yet, but it will be eventually. It will. It will. <laughs> I promise you that. Yeah. Uh, so what 
type of people are on your team? Uh, what are their degrees and backgrounds and what are some of the skills other than the ones that you already described that somebody would need to succeed in a job like yours? Yeah, so actually having some sort of um, health degree, first of all, bachelor's degree in nursing, because initially I just thought, you know, having a PhD would be all that would be required, but having a, some sort of health related degree. So everybody on my medical core team that I work with is either a, a medical or was a medical doctor. Yeah, is still a medical doctor because he's still practicing. We have a physician assistant as well. Um, I'm the only PhD on my team. And so that's why they give me most of the research work to do. Um, on other people that we work, that work on our team, but they're not core members, they're all medical doctors, but they are not located here in Birmingham. So we have a guy, he's in Australia, and we have a lady, she's in Boston, she works for, she works with Harvard. But, so everybody has some sort of medical background, I would say. Now the analysts are different, so I don't work with them on a day-to-day, -day, but we work on cross-functional teams together, and many of them are public health um, professionals. So they have either a bachelor's or a master's in public health. Um, some biostats, but primarily epi, epidemio um, epidemiology. Um, some other people in the public publishing department, they are located in Wisconsin. And many of them are not scientists. Their backgrounds are mainly journalism, I think, or something related to not science, not science related. So, so they're not part of my core team, you know, but we, I work with them. So sometimes like, you know, we're, we have stuff out there we want to publish and then usually I just message them and say, hey, you know, this is, this is where we're framing this. Is this, does this science sound too sciencey, you know, or is this, will this be understood by our audience? Because we actually have different um, categories of our audience. So some are actually core scientists and medical doctors or medical directors of their companies. And I actually wouldn't mention a whole lot of names because I'm not allowed to reveal who all our subscribers are, but the Department of Defense is our biggest, our biggest client. And so everything under that, and I will not mention names, and then some of the big multinational companies as well. And I don't know if I can, I'm not gonna mention their names as well, but, and then, so those are categories. And then we also have individual providers. We have um, travel medicine doctors who, see people who travel a lot and they want information about, you know, the destination they're going to or diseases endemic there. And they don't want to have to go PubMed and CDC sites and then go look at what the Chinese health organization is saying or what the World Health Organization is saying. They just want to go to one site that gives them all the information they need. And so individual travel medicine providers, um, all, the all the U.S. embassies uh, are subscribers. And then aside from that, we have uh, we have the lay public so part of what i do is not just to give our medical folks the information they need i also need to be able to communicate a portion of that information to the lay public in words they can easily understand so i actually like it because sometimes sometimes i'm like okay let me let me, I mean, we have rules we follow, but I, I have tried to translate it in, in a way that anybody can understand what we're trying to say here. So it's, it's a long, long story short, the people I work with are different, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, all have, <laughs> we have different backgrounds, but it helps because our audience is also very different, you know, and so sometimes I, we, we say stuff and it's caught by somebody who doesn't really have a science background and they and then before it goes out, they're like, oh, is this what you really meant to say? And sometimes I stick stand by it and say, yeah, that's what we actually want to say. Because that's what the WHO is saying right now. Or that's what the official official um, 
um, statement is. And other times they actually catch stuff. And I'm like, oh, thanks for catching that. Now I see it could be misunderstood. Okay, yeah, let's rewrite that and make it in a way that will be understood, but will also be accurate. So there are different people you know, on our team. We actually have a respiratory therapist on our team as well, but he's, he heads a different unit. But they are part of the Birmingham group here. So we walk together, talk about work and <laughs> yeah. And yeah, other teams, we also have a, a team that deals with, with facilities and hospitals. So one of the, one of the um, product, well, one of the things we do is we, almost all the countries in the world, we have tips, we call them Travax International Partners. And they are people who are boots on the ground who give us real time information about like what I said, what we see online. And so once in a while we need, many of them also health professionals or people who work in the hospitals or who are working in hospitals or people who do research. And we try to find out information, not just about diseases that are endemic or political unrest or you know drug availability, but also about their hospital facilities. So we need to know, do they have, you know, how many trauma, you know, bed, or how many beds do they have in this big massive hospital in case we have some of our special people who are going to be traveling to that country. We need to know what facilities are available, you know, for people who go there. And so we have this huge database of facilities. Or do they have CAT scans? In that, uh, do they have, um, M how many MRI machines do they have there? Do they have a helipad for, you know, if they, they need to evacuate people? And so they are, so there's a different team that works on that. I, I'm not very privy to the information they have, but I know they're always updating that information, always updating it. So when somebody in say the military needs, or they need to deploy people to that area, they have information they need up to not just political stuff, but disease stuff, drug stuff, hospital stuff, hospital information. So, so that they know what they're going into and it's not, it's not a huge surprise and they know how to prepare themselves before they go there. So, um, yeah. That so sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, what else do I have for my list? Um, so you've mentioned that you go for walks with your colleagues a lot, or used to. <laughs> uh, how in general would you describe your work-life balance? Now versus <laughs> earlier in your career, how has it changed? Well, what? I just want to, I want to encourage <laughs> you, first of all, that life is better on the other side. <laughs> and I want to encourage you to push through grad school and that there are so many options out there, seriously. You know, grad school is tough. I get that. And, you know, I mean, if, if you can take one thing out of everything I say today, when I was in grad school, it was hard. Uh, I know, I mean, it was really hard. Not just, you know, it wasn't academically. I mean, grades were good and all that, but going through the process with so many challenges that were thrown my way, including ill health and having to take months out of school just to recover and come back to a semblance of normal. But I'm glad I pushed through. I'm glad I had a support system to help me get through it and get to the other side. And so work-life balance, no more sleepless nights. I actually have, <laughs> I have more time <laughs> than I thought I would ever have in my life. So I'll be honest with you, when I, when I finished my postdoc, oh yeah, postdoc was, was harder than grad school because it was a lot of work, you know, it was more responsibility, yeah, not just mentoring people, you're also teaching classes, you're also doing research and multiple projects at the same time, not just like your dissertation projects, you were juggling from projects at the same time. And so when I decided, when I actually decided to leave academia, it was a decision I had to make because I said, are you do you really want to leave? Because, I mean, I had funding and then I was, I, I think I was on my second year of a four-year fund grant and I was now applying for a different grant as well. So I was trying to get preliminary data for that project and it was a very stressful time, to be honest. Like, I really wasn't having time for my life, but more importantly then we had just one child for my family. I really wasn't having time 
you know, for my family. And it was becoming, you know, not just exhausting physically and mentally, but the fact that it was affecting lives around me, you know, that, that made me feel guilty a lot. And to me, the questions I had to ask myself was, first of all, you know, what's the end of this? And this is my story. It doesn't mean it's going to apply to every single person. This is my story. I was like, what's, what's the end, you know? So if I get this next grant that I want, then, okay, then I become an assistant professor and then, okay, I become an associate and then I, I become a full professor. And then do I get to rest? Do I get to take a break from all the stress of chasing grants and writing papers and doing experiments? And so I, I did a lot of informational interviews. I talked to a lot of people at stages of their, of their career, assistant professors, associate professors, full professors. You know, just general gist in, but it was me, it was more fact finding. And I remember talking to a full professor then, and he was, you know, writing multiple R1s, not getting funded, or getting great scores, but still not getting funded. And I was like, this is a super smart guy. I mean, he's a super smart, intelligent guy. And so I remember asking him then, I was like, hey, you know, you're now a full professor, you've been a full professor for so long. So when is this going to end? When are you going to relax? And I was like, no, this is the life, you know. And I was like, so I'm never going to have work-life balance. He was like, no, you know, I mean, he had work-life balance. He would go home, but I could see how stressed out he was and how worried he was about his grants and all that. And so, so I just said, all right, I'm going to start applying for jobs. And the plan then, to be honest, my husband told me, yeah, let's just apply, you know, see if you are, um, if you are prepared for the real world, you know, go on interviews and see if you actually have what it takes to, to, if people need, if you are needed, let me use those words, you know, are you prepared enough? Are you, maybe you still need more training and, and that's how I, I landed this interview. And, <laughs> you know, when I got the job, I told my husband, I said, well, you said it's just practice. Like I wasn't really planning to leave, you know, academia yet, but it was now, okay, sit down. Let's weigh things. Do you really want to, what's the future of this? Is this how you want to live your life? versus and I'm not saying that choice is wrong my husband is in academia so I'm not saying that choice is wrong I'm just saying that you need to be true to yourself find out what works for you and ask questions ask questions from a lot of people try to see what the future what the future holds is this is this how I want to live my life so when I when I left my postdoc and I started the job I mean aside from you know exponential increase in pay it was also less significantly less stressful <laughs> and i would get home from work and i would be like okay what do i do with my time i don't know what to do because <laughs> i'm just home and and normally i'm never home that early i just, i'm at work till 8 p.m sometimes you know doing close isometry till 2 a.m sometimes and and then i get home and they're like okay i don't know what to do and so it just dawned on me that, hey, this is what the real looks like. Enjoy it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Try to make the most of your time out of work and outside work. And so, so aside from my main job, I have some other side hustles that I do. I work with some other teams, you know, and other projects. And it made me feel more alive. So I feel like more aspects of me are being utilized when it comes to this whole science thing. So it's not just about, okay, I do infectious disease research at work. Yes, that's what I do. When I work on other projects with, you know, some other teams, maybe as a consultant, I'm, I'm being, I, I'm, they reach out to me based on the knowledge I have, the information I have. So maybe one aspect of me is being used here, but there are other aspects of my life that will, that's also useful and will be a blessing to other teams or other people, you know, around. And so, I, I actually felt more fulfilled, you know, when I left and I began to see, okay, there are other things I can do with my time that would also make a difference in the world of science. And so I still collaborate with some of my colleagues on when they're writing papers, help with some of the research. Somebody reached out to me saying, hey, you know, we're working on a diabetes um, education. And I was like, oh yeah, my master's project, I did cancer, um, cancer media education. I mean, let's, I can do this and you get paid for your services. Somebody else reached out, you know, and nobody was doing, reaching out to me when I was doing my postdoc because 
I didn't even have time to breathe. <laughs> so I was at work on other projects, you know. But like I say, all the skills you're getting now in grad school, they're part of your training. And later on, you're going to find out that as people reach out to you or you find out that, oh, there's a need here. I can actually help fill this need here. Okay, there's this team that need grant, needs grant writing experience. I do have grant writing experience. I can help fill this need here. You know, I found myself being able to do more and still not get as exhausted or as tired or as frustrated as I was when I was in academia. But like I said, you need to figure out what works for you. What's, what, what am I passionate about? And how do I, some people are passionate about academia. Even before I met my husband, I knew he was gonna be an academic for life. I don't know, he might change his mind tomorrow, but as at today, you know, that's where we are. And that's his passion, you know. I enjoyed it while it lasted, but hey, there's more to life. <laughs> that's my take. So work-life balance, awesome. <laughs> that's nice to hear. <laughs> what that one day it can get can get better. <laughs> it will get better, sincerely. I wish I knew I I, I understood this in grad school, you know. It was, and the, I would have had more joy living every single day of my life, you know. But seriously, it's it does get better. It does. Yeah. It's getting, that's nice to hear. So, since you just mentioned you wish you had known that it, work life balance get be, gets better after grad school, what's something else that you wish somebody had told you before? Huh. You yeah, I think I wish someone had told me that. Life doesn't consist in how many papers you publish. <laughs> because, you know, in grad school, sometimes it's just, uh, there's this thing, oh, how many papers have you published? You know, um, it's like we, can't, we measure our success by the number of grants we have and the number of papers we've published. In the real world, nobody, I shouldn't say nobody cares. Okay, so take that back. It's important, but it's not that important. It's more about what can you do to solve this problem we need right now. You know, even when I was interviewing and I was talking about papers of publishing and all that, I'm like, yeah, it's good you've published, but this is a different ball game entirely. You know, we it's the way we write is different. You know, the the structure you have to follow is different. And so I had to unlearn some of the things I learned in the way I write when I was publishing versus the way we want to follow this standard, our style guide. And so, and you know, sometimes I just wonder, oh, you've okay, published all these papers. How many people, how many people are actually reading these papers? <laughs> I mean, and I don't mean scientists, because scientists were just a minute proportion of the entire world, you know. But I'm talking about everyday people who need solutions to their daily lives problems. We're talking about coronavirus now. You know, the lay person out there who's out there protesting or who is your next door neighbor, they're not reading your papers, but they want to know, based on your scientific um, 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 background, how do you think I can survive this or avoid this or, you know, and so, so what, what do I wish I'd known in grad school? You know, I, I wish I'd known that, yeah, the currency of academia is your papers and your grants, but in the real world, it's how you, how you, um, translates your training and your background to be a blessing to somebody next door or somebody reaches out to you and says hey very confused about all that's happening you know being able to answer those questions and then they tell you how grateful they are you know or whether they tell you they're grateful or not that's fine i mean but at least it gives you a sense of fulfillment that okay my training wasn't all a waste you know i'm able to communicate i'm able to um, I'm able to show that I can do the research and solve a problem here or, or help push things forward. What else did I learn in grad? What, what else did I, I wish I'd learned in grad school? You're, um, you're making friends with people, not just within your, your, is it, are you still on the third floor? Third and fourth floor, you know, beyond the walls of pharmacy, you know, meeting people outside like going to conferences and not just staying with my in my cocoon with my people but actually meeting people from other what making friends with people from other schools or other companies 
I mean, those, those are the things that form the fabric of your interconnectedness and your connections because you never know when somebody else out there is going to need your help or you're going to need their help as well. And so in grad school, I remember I was very focused on me, my lab, my work, my, the people just around me, you know, and not the big picture out there, you know, and being able to see that, hey, life doesn't just consist on in my orbit. I need to be able to make connections with people outside, learn something about something, somebody else, their research or what they're doing, you know, and it actually makes you a global citizen. One question I got during my interview, it, it had nothing to do with research. It was like, oh, okay, um, can you name five cities in China? And I was like, say what? Like, why don't you give me a different country, you know? Or there was a question about, oh, what is border Brazil? And I was like, oh my gosh, okay, okay, let me think. I mean, I was able to answer the questions, but this is not stuff you learn in grad school. Nobody, it's, it's just trying to show that, hey, my head isn't just stuck in my books. I'm aware of what's going on around me. I don't have blinders on. I'm aware of what's happening with Black Lives Matter matters. I'm, I'm aware of, um, uh, of what's happening in the political landscape. I'm aware of what's happening in Myanmar. Really, I don't know what's happening there right now, but, but just, just you know, generally saying that I'm not just a scientist who, all, who just knows my studies. I'm very aware of what's happening around. And so I think, you know, grad school is stressful, yes, but when you're interviewing for jobs, then they're not just going to ask about your science. They want to know if you're a well-rounded individual. They want to know if this person is going to fit in my team. And so if you haven't worked with others and you only care about succeeding, you haven't helped somebody else succeed, and I'm even going to have stories to tell about, oh, this is how I navigated this conflict situation. Oh, this is how um, I was able to help solve this problem. You're not even going to have genuine stories to tell. And you end up having to fabricate stuff and, you know, people will see through that. So grad school is good. It's good to be busy with your studies. It's good to get all the A's in the world, you know. But in the real world, nobody's going to interview you and ask how many A's you got. They want to know <laughs> how did you interact with people you worked with? You know, were you successful? You know, the projects you worked on, how long did it take you? Why did it take you that long? What did you learn along the process? So I don't know if I answered your question, but. Oh yeah, that, that was a really good okay. answer. <laughs> yeah. Covered a lot of different aspects and points that I was trying to get it. Yeah. So for soon future graduates, with a PhD, uh, what do you think are just some of the challenges that we will have to face in the job market and trying to get a job and interviewing and getting out there? Oh, let me see. What can I say about that? <laughs> because there's coronavirus now. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. However, however, people are still being hired. I hope you know that. So I think the first thing is you have to have a, a very positive mindset. Because as a man believes in his heart, that's, that's who he, he really is. So if in your mind you know, oh, it's not going to happen, there are no jobs, it's not going to, that's what's going to happen, you know. But first of all, have a very positive can-do mindset. I mean, it's one thing grad school also teaches you. This experiment has to work. I'm not going to plagiarize, I'm not going <laughs> to fudge the data, but it's going to work. And so you try to troubleshoot to make sure it works, find out what the problem is. And then if it doesn't work, I should say you've tried everything that you know it wasn't meant to work. We're not just going to give up the first time. And so, you know, having a positive mindset that, okay, things may be tough, but I, I'm going to add value to my society. There's a company out there or there's a job out there for me and, I, and I'm going to go for it. So first of all, that mental mind shift has to be there. Second thing I, I would encourage you to do is, I mean, I'm sure you all use LinkedIn. Go back to your LinkedIn profile, make it look speak and span, tidy up, up, you know, make it ready so that even if somebody says, hey, I have a colleague, you know, he's about to graduate, he needs a job, and then someone checks you out on LinkedIn and it looks like a Facebook 
No, you want <laughs> you want your LinkedIn to show, okay, this is a professional. This professional knows what she's doing, you know, he knows what he's doing and he's ready for the job market, you know. Get your papers out. I'm a proponent of it. Even though I said nobody really cares. When I say nobody cares, I mean your your next door neighbor. The vast majority of the world doesn't care. You know, but your job, the person who's gonna hire you, they might care. They might want you to talk about your research. Nobody asked me to talk about my research, but it doesn't mean for you, then they're not gonna ask to talk about your research, you know. And I, I mean, I've talked to other people also. Everybody gets different interview questions. And so it depends on the kind of job you're going for. If you're going for like a lab-based research scientist job, oh yeah, they might want to hear about your research. But if we're, what you're going for is more client facing, where they want to see um, how you are going to interact with our clients or how you're going to work with the other team members. They might ask that you talk about your research, but it's not their priority. They actually studying you to see what kind <laughs> of skills, you know, nonverbal cues, your, um, how you carry yourself. That's what that interview is all about. It's not really about content of your research. So get your papers out. Yes. Get them published. You don't want to leave grad school and um, keep trying to get your papers published. It, it is harder. And from experience, yeah, experience. It is harder <laughs> <laughs> to publish it when you've graduated and you've gone. So get your papers published, get it out there. And for, I would also suggest a lot of informational interviews right now. You're about to graduate. You have connections on LinkedIn. And then when you are sending, you know, connection requests to other people, make it personalized, you know, oh, I, I, I heard about you. I read your paper on XYZ and, you know, I learned about ABC. I'd love to connect with you. Or your first connection shouldn't be about asking for a job or asking for help. Most of my connections then when I was, especially during my postdoc, I was just connecting with people sincerely because just I wanted to know about their jobs. I wanted to know what exactly they did. I saw these job titles out there, but I really didn't know what it entailed. And like I said, I had funding, so it wasn't as if, oh, I needed to find a job right away. It was more about, I'm gonna need this information six months, one year down the line. I'm gonna establish a connection with this person now, but more importantly, find out more about this job, find out more of what it entails, find out if this is actually the life I wanna live, you know? There's some jobs that require 80% travel. Others require no travel, you know, and everybody's in different phases of life. And so even though this is a job, I feel I can do this 100%. But am I willing to leave home 80% of the time? Oh, the money is good. Yeah, but I have to travel. Eh. So those, those informational interviews actually help you figure out, title aside, is this a life I want to leave? you know, and then let your connections work for you. So if you connect with somebody and person knows you're in grad school, yeah, you're graduating sometime soon, but you're actually fact finding and you're asking questions, it's easier for them to help. It's easier for them to reach out and say, hey, yeah, I can do an informational interview. You want 30 minutes, that's fine. And they can talk about everything because they know you're not making any demands on them. But later on, maybe six months down the line, you find out there's a job in that company. You really want that job then that connection request that you sent earlier on will come in handy because this connection kind of knows you, might be willing to put in a word for you, might actually take your CV or your resume and hand it to the hiring manager and say, hey, give him a, take a look at this person. I think he's a good one. You know, you skip many steps that way. So, and I mean, just try to do the best. You're about to leave grad school. You're about to move into a new phase, you know, of adulthood. <laughs> I know we're all adults, but it's a new phase of adulthood. So enjoy where you are because honestly, the people you are seeing every day, working with every day, you're probably not going to see them, all of you together in one space again for the rest of your life. Even if you have alumni meetings, not everybody's going to come back. So enjoy the relationships you have now. Leave that place with a good, a good sense. I tried my best. I don't have any bad feelings or ill feelings towards anybody, whether they're my professors or they're my colleagues, because you're probably never, ever, ever going to meet together again. And so that sense of finality, you know, makes me 
cherish my relationships. I know that doesn't have to do with your work because that's going, but there are people there that, I mean, Katina is still there, right? I reached out to one of my friends, Mo. So Mo and I, Mo, Dan, yeah, you remember Mo, right? Absolutely. Okay, so when um, when coronavirus started, I, and I know on LinkedIn, we stayed in touch, you know, as, I mean, it wasn't like we're chatting every day, but we we're connected on LinkedIn, you know, and and um, for PGSRM, it's still called, is it PGSRM? Yes. PG, yes. So both of us tried and ensured that UK, UK College of Pharmacy was going to be allowed to host in 2015, right? Yes. Was it 2015 you hosted? I both left. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so, so we kind of applied for it. We went through all the ranks, you know, talking to the dean, talking to everybody, convincing the APS student chapter to bid for hosting, hosting rights for 2015, even though we were going to be gone. Anyway, so Mo and I worked together on that project and we stayed in touch, kind of. So when the coronavirus hits, you know, I, I didn't need anything from Mo. I just tried to remember, oh, who are my friends that we work together. And I know she was back in China. She was working for the Chinese CDC or something government, something governmental. I don't know. And so I just sent her a message and say, Hey, I know you're not in Wuhan, but I'm just reaching out to say, hope you're fine. You know, and, and I didn't hear back from her for, for weeks. And then much later on, she responded and said, Oh yeah, we're, we're all on lockdown and blah, blah, blah. And that was it. A colleague of mine, she is an MD. She was doing her MPH and then she worked with us for a little bit at Shoreland. And then she found a big, uh, a big job back home in Brazil. So she moved her whole family back to Brazil. And she messaged me and said, hey, we're having a meeting with the governmental officials and they wanted to order a large consignment of COVID tests kits. And she said, yeah, I know back at Shoreland, I know you guys are working on this every day. Can you recommend COVID tests that are authentic, that would be good, because I think the, the government wanted to order, import a huge batch. Now, this is, she said, I'm about to walk into the meeting. Please help me. Who did I reach out to? Mo. <laughs> I messaged Mo back in China. I said, hey, Mo, I need your help real quick. Now, and, you know, she was like, yeah, she sent me a list and screenshot. I mean, within two hours, the information cross continents was shared. Now, if I hadn't reached out to Mo, I would have kind of felt a little, uh, can I talk to her about this? We haven't talked in years, you know, but I felt like, I mean, Mo is my friend. She's willing to help. And within minutes, she solved that problem. So when I say cherish your relationships, you don't know who, you don't know where anybody is there. I see names, Ashley, Julie, Mary, um, Humei, Freddie, Pum, Evan, Casey, Nicole, Ro Rosa, Yulia, Katina, Annette, Brianna, R, I don't know, R, R, R something, Howard, <laughs> anyway, that's his name, but you don't know where they're going to end up in life. You have no idea, you know, and you don't know when you're going to need someone's help. I mean, I'm not saying you should stay in touch because you, you, you want to need help, but I'm just saying we're all human and we're like water. We've met now, we might never meet again, you know, but cherish your friendships, cherish your relationships, cherish the bonds you have, you know, and you never know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it has to do with your job job, but it's just something I learned in grad school. And I learned that actually when I was living in high school and someone just told me that, you see all these friends, they never, all going to be together again never and it hasn't happened i've left grad school i don't know how many years ago and then when i was finishing pharmacy school i had that same mind you're 60 of you are graduating you're all going to end up in different parts of the world you are never ever all going to be together again cherish your relationships cherish your friendships now you're in grad school you're graduating in different cohorts yeah so I, I really hope, <laughs> I hope you take that to the heart. <laughs> you know, I know the world is interconnected. We're all on Facebook, we're all on, you know, um, LinkedIn, but it's different. Mm -hmm. it, it is different. So that's it. That was really insightful. Thank you so much.
Uh, are yeah, there yeah. other questions from the audience? Anything that we haven't touched on that you would like to know about? Doesn't seem like it. Well, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank and you for inviting me. For the great insight you've provided on your job and life in general. <laughs> Light at the end of the tunnel. I know. Yeah. <laughs> we really appreciate your time and everything. Yeah. yeah. So. And feel free to reach out. You know, if there's anything I can do to help, just let me know, please. I, I enjoyed my time, you know, in Kentucky. And honestly, I'm not saying this because Katina is there, but she was a <laughs> tremendous resource to me. I really mean that. She wasn't just there as staff. She was there like a friend to me. She was there as a emotional support buddy <laughs> to me. She was, she was just amazing, you know, and so, and I've, I stay, I mean, I still in touch with some of my professors, you know, and I reach out to them sometimes once in a while, you know, and I nominate them for awards, even though nobody's telling me to do it, but I, I appreciate my, I appreciate, I still do appreciate the time I had there, you know, and your success is their success. The fact that you are a trainee and you passed through, regardless of how tough it is, regardless of the daily drama, it's going to be in your past. It's going to be your history. Your future is far greater than your, <laughs> your present, seriously. So don't let the drama, don't let it get to you. Don't. Don't. I don't know who I'm talking to, but seriously, <laughs> don't let it get to you. Just keep your eyes focused on the prize. You're getting your dissertation done, your defense done, get your PhD, and then you have a ticket to a, a, a brand new world of opportunity out there. There are some jobs that would not be given to somebody who doesn't have a PhD. They will not even be considered. And so that gives you opportunities that others are never going to have. So stay strong. You've gotten this far. You know, you get to the end. <laughs> Thank you. So feel that free to reach out. Great to ending. Yeah. <laughs> great fun work. Thank you so much. I'm sure many of us. Thank will. you. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. We'll need to get in touch, okay? <laughs>